James Currier is a serial entrepreneur and early stage investor with several successful exits under his belt. He's now the managing partner at NFX Guild, a venture capital firm focused on networks effects businesses. I've known James for years, first as a fellow entrepreneur, raising money and building products here in Silicon Valley, and later as an investor and colleague with a strong thesis and a hunger to experiment with different funding models. Like me, James has worked in games, apps, and marketplaces, and his unique system literate point of view is shaped by those experiences. I love his take on the difference between viral growth and network effects. That's a viral effect. That is a viral effect, meaning your users get you other users for free. That is a different thing than a network effect. And this is one of the biggest misconceptions about what network effects are. It does not mean it goes viral. James has a deep understanding of startup dynamics and great stories from the front lines of steering a fast growing business and building an incubator in the shadow of Y Combinator. Join us and discover why so many of today's unicorns are powered by network effects. Plus, pick up some tips about how you can harness this power to help your business take off. Welcome to Game Thinking TV, James. Oh, it's great to be here. Thanks for having me. I'm so thrilled to get a chance to hang out with you today and let the listeners also hang out with you. Let's get started by plunging right into the middle of things. So how did you go from becoming, uh, running an incubator to becoming a VC? What's the difference? So we had looked at Y Combinator and the network effects that they have in their investing style. And we think that it's superior and different to the, than the, what we call the legal approach. So most venture firms in the late 60s and 70s were founded on the, the law model, right? I mean, look at Klein or Perkins, sounds like a law firm. And, uh, these companies got going with uh, a look and feel that's very much like a law office. And that was the model for the first 20, 30 years of venture capital. And uh, when you start to see something like a, a Y Combinator where they're building out a big network of founders, they're building out an ecosystem, they're building a system, they have a systems thinking, if you will, about the design of their venture firm, you realize that that's going to be the winning model uh, long term. And it was uh, something we appreciated about their approach. And so we thought, you know, if we're going to get into this business, let's see if we can't do it with a network effect. Um, and so we started an accelerator uh, under those auspices. Plus, uh, the, the people who started it were, we love to coach. And we love the early stage. And we love the product market fit phase and the brand building and the, the early growth strategies. And that's really our wheelhouse because, you know, again, I, I had done many, many venture back startups before. And that process was familiar to me. And I thought maybe I can be helpful. To, to founders doing that. So that all, that all fit together. And, and so we, we got a, a small fund together, about, about 14 million. Uh, most of that was our money. And then some from Greylock and CRV and Shasta and Mayfield, who are great partners to us. And we're looking for the downstream investment opportunities and companies that we were going to accelerate. And we went out and, and did five classes of about 15 companies each and really started to, you know, get on a groove around that. But there was some adverse selection on the founders we were seeing. And, and it was also the case that in order to scale up our brand, in order to scale up our applications, we needed to, you know, broaden our uh, awareness. Uh, and we were playing a, a second fiddle to YC in the market. And so rather than play second fiddle, we figured let's, let's go out and be a real venture firm, more like a first round where we're a seed investor investing one to 3 million for, you know, 10 to 15% of a company. And, um, and do that and, and grow our brand and our awareness that way. And, uh, and so that's what we've done. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, the, the workflow is very different. Uh, when you're running an accelerator, you are on a calendar. Uh, one of the magic things about an accelerator is that the founders are compressed into a three-month period before demo day. And they get about a year's worth of work done in three months under those conditions. But the fact is the people running the accelerator are also on that time clock. You're under that pressure. Mm -hmm. um, and so that, that can be quite wearing. It's quite a treadmill. Um, and venture capital, much different challenges where every day it's sort of a waterfall of potential meetings. And the types of decisions you make all day are who to meet with, you know, because someone comes in, should you meet with them or not? Um, I, every day I get an invitation from another VC to meet with me to sort of share deals or see what we're looking at to stay top of mind, if you will. And it's a very inefficient process. Very nice people, but I could have two or three VC meetings a day and, and not get much else done. So I have to say no to most of those. 
and then when, when it comes to the founders, you know, then you get all these people sending you deals and you're probably getting 12 deals a day. You can maybe meet with three, four, five new ones a day, but you can't meet with all of them. So you have to figure out which ones you should meet with and which ones you shouldn't. And that's a daily basis. And the other thing that I'll say that, that many people probably don't even think of is that when a founder comes in to meet with you, as I was a founder most of my career, they're very hopeful that you're going to invest. Unfortunately, we invest in about 0.4 or 0.5% of the companies we meet with, let alone the ones we don't even meet with, which means that you know, we're saying no 199 times out of 200. And, uh, and so their, their expected probability of getting investment from you is much higher than the actual numbers would suggest. And, and therefore, when you say no, it's a little bit like breaking up with a relationship. So in my case, we'd be breaking up with a girlfriend. Uh, you know, you know, three, four, five times a day where you have to break the bad news to someone who really wants to be in a long-term relationship with you. Um, and it's just not going to happen. Um, and so that's, that's, uh, that's a very different process than the accelerator where, you know, you're saying no to people in batches over email. Um, and they're kind of expecting to get a no because they know the probability is better. So it's uh, it's a very different type of, of behavior in the day. And, and it's uh, in each case, it's a, a man matter of managing your own psychology in, in the job, just like it was when, when I was a founder trying to manage my founder psychology. Give us a, a glimpse into how you became this person who's gone through entrepreneurship and running an incubator and VC and just um, helping all these startups become successful. Where did you get started in tech and startups and design? And what were those key pivot points along the way that shaped your career? Oh, yeah. Um, I guess uh, the, the full story for people who are listening would be that, you know, I started selling worms to fishermen near my house in New Hampshire when I was six. And then I started selling seeds door to door. And then I started selling t-shirts and pictures of a Farrah Fawcett cut out that I would buy the, the magazine for 25 cents and sell all the pictures cut up for a dollar. And, and um, you know, I was always looking for ways of making money. This was always an interest of mine. And I was always in the business of creating things. You know, I, I built a hovercraft that went 35 miles an hour when I was 13 through 15. And then I started a t-shirt company and a boxer shirt company and did all the designs myself. So there was a lot of, a lot of creativity and entrepreneurship sort of in my childhood. Where did, uh, then, what sparked that? Was there a, uh, a relative who <coughs> did that or where'd you get the idea? Um, I, we were, I mean, a couple of things. My dad was, a, was an entrepreneur. My grandfather invented the first baseball pitching machine and went around the country selling that. Oh my um, goodness. <laughs> and, and my dad ended up becoming a, a, a home builder and tried being a solar technology salesman. You know, and so we would go to, the, we, we would get booths at the malls uh, when I was a little kid and I would go and man the booths with him. So we were always trying to figure out how, how the whole system worked. And, and I guess it, it's either genetic or it's cultural or, um, uh, and, and the other thing was that we were, we didn't have a lot of money. The family that I grew up in, uh, we didn't have much money. So if I wanted money, I needed to earn it. And so there was sort of a necessity there as well that, that led me toward figuring out how, how wealth was created. And um, I guess the, you know, I then went through, you know, my dad said, look, the way up is, is through education. So it was a real focus on education. And I got scholarships for my high school. I went off to a, a prep school and I got a scholarship to go there. And then I got a scholarship to go to college. I didn't even got a scholarship to go to business school. Uh, I didn't have any, any money when, when HBS accepted me. So they, they were nice enough to, to lend me the money. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and uh, I guess the inflection point happened. Um, when I took the first job out of college, uh, it was with a big telecommunications company and they put me in a training program. And one of the jobs on the list that I could apply for within the training program was called Venture Capital. So it was the internal venture group. It was out in Los Angeles. And I had heard from a friend in a hot tub that there was this thing called Venture Capital. And this what this thing did was it gave money to entrepreneurs and founders to help them grow their business. And I had logged that in my head that, wow, that, I didn't even know there was such a thing. And so when I saw this on this list of about 150 different job opportunities for trainees in this company, it said venture capital. I'm like, oh, that reminds me of that hot tub thing I have in my head. And so I called the guy up and he hired me. He said, sure, come on out to Los Angeles and join me. And so we were out there in 91 uh, looking at broadband applications for the entertainment industry in Los Angeles. And that was really the turning point where I realized that 
you know, movies and TV and, 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 and sound are all going to be digitized, turned into ones and zeros and sent over the wires. That was the, the vision. There was a guy named John Dion who was at GTE, this 180,000 person monolith of a company. Not a super bright company, but this guy, John, was very smart. This was what he was evangelizing, and he had created this new ventures group. And so I was a lucky recipient at age 21 of being able to do that. And so I learned about startups. I learned about business plans. I learned about venture capital while I was working there for, for about a year, year and a half. Uh, through a bunch of different things, ended up finding out that this company in Boston called Battery Ventures had an associate position open. And I asked a friend to introduce me, and he introduced me. It was John Callahan, actually. John Callahan introduced me to who is now running True Ventures. He, oh, yeah. He was working at Summit, and um, he introduced me to Battery. And so I went over to Battery, and seven days later, they gave me a job. But I had an interesting interview with Ollie Kerm, who was the partner there. He said, James, why do you want this job? And I said, because I want to help entrepreneurs. He says, wrong. And, I, and he says, why do you want this job? And I said, um, because I want to make a lot of money. And he goes, wrong, you're not going to make any money here. In fact, you should pay us to work here. Why do you want this job? I'm like, I don't know, Ollie. Tell me why I want this job. He says, because you're going to learn how wealth is generated, and it's going to serve you for the rest of your career. He said, you're going to be here for three years. And at the end of it, you're going to know more about how wealth is generated in the economy than, than most people. And I was like, okay, that sounds like a great deal. I'm in. And so they paid me very low salary. I worked my guts out, and I did indeed learn how the whole system worked watching how these partners did it, being an associate, dialing for dollars and trying to, you know, get founders to take our money. Uh, so that was, that was really the, the beginning of me understanding the whole industry. And then I went off to HBS and then I decided to be a founder because I had this idea in my head. I could not. So I was either going to go back and be a partner at CRV uh, in Boston uh, with Mike Zach and, you know, the, the firm that now has Sarger and all those folks, mm -hmm. or I was going to be a founder. But I was at dinner with Mike Zach and he was like, look, we're, we're, we're making you this offer, but I'm not sure you want to be a VC or do you want to be a founder? You really need to make that decision. And in the end, I said to him, I can't get this business idea out of my head. He goes, then you need to go do that. You need to go do that. And, and so I did. I went off and I, and I did what ended up becoming my first company, which was Tickle. And the idea behind it was that uh, it was going to be self-generated content. We weren't going to watch Nicole Kidman and Tom Cruise on the internet. We were going to watch each other and we were going to watch ourselves. And that that was what the internet technology, the many to many media technology platform, that was what it was uniquely good at. And so that was going to be the future. And I was going to build a company to, to, to do that. And that ended up being, you know, social networking that ended up being test taking that, you know, all the things that we now see, that was sort of the idea. And then we did that. And uh, luckily, you know, we were three days away from going out of business and then we were 60 days away from going out of business twice during that company. So we were very lucky uh, to get through the crash and to survive and then to sell the company to uh, Monster in 2004. But, um, and so I guess, I guess that was the third inflection, which was really, um, or the fourth inflection, which was getting lucky enough to have a successful first attempt at being a founder. And that gave me the credibility and the capital to go off and, and try multiple other hits at that. You know? um, and so I, I did, I, I went and made three more venture back companies over the next 10 years. You mentioned uh, network effects. Can you just define what you mean by network effects? And then maybe give us an example or a story about a company that has network effects versus one that doesn't. Yeah. So a network effect in my mind, very simply, is that every new user of your product makes the product better for all the other users. Does user number two make it better for user number one? Does user number 1,000 make it better for user number one? And that simple idea ends up taking a lot of different forms. And we've actually identified 13 different types of network effects. We've written about it. You can go to nfx.com essays, and, and we've written very extensively about how we see the world around network effects because we've been studying it now for two decades. Um, you know, you've got data network effects, you've got um, direct network effects, you've got two-sided platform network effects, which are different from two-sided marketplace network effects and different from asymptoting network effects. So there's lots of different ways to slice it. And there's lots of different playbooks for each type of network uh, effect, but um, that's a lot of esoterica that we help founders understand because um, it's taken us a long time to understand it. Um, I'll give you an example of, of what I mean. So when I started this company, Tickle, uh, back in 99, it was a media company and you would you would, as a user, come on, take tests about yourself, 
and then that would be it. You'd be on there for an hour, hour and a half. You'd answer two, 300 questions about yourself. You'd be entertained. And then you'd go away and you would send this test to a friend um, and they might take it as well. That's a viral effect. That is a viral effect, meaning your users get you other users for free. That is a different thing than a network effect. And this is one of the biggest misconceptions about what network effects are. It does not mean it goes viral. Viral effects are their own playbook. Viral effects are great, but that's not what we're talking about with network effects. My company had good viral effects, and we registered 175 million people when there was only 600 million people on the internet. It was, it was kind of a big deal at its time. The problem was there was no network effect, meaning I didn't care that my friend kept using it, and my friend couldn't continue to add value to me over time. And so... Uh, people just wouldn't come back. And anyone who wanted to launch a website with a lot of tests on it, like ours, could just jump in and get a lot of traffic, just like we were getting. There was no defensibility uh, that we could build. There was just a lot of growth. So as we saw matchmaking, we're like, hey, let's use our tests to match people up, because at least there's a little bit of a network effect. The more women, the more men, the more people want to be there. But again, people only use that for about three or four months and then they churn off and there's another matchmaking site and it's really not that defensible a business. So then we saw social networking or we kind of invented social networking. We called it a member directory uh, before it was called social networking. And um, that seemed to have much more of a network effect. So we built one of those and grew that to 30 million people. Uh, but we didn't have real names. This was all before Facebook launched. We didn't have real names. And so it wasn't as sticky as the two networks that were the first to have real names, which was LinkedIn and, and Facebook, right? Still the most viable social networks in the English speaking language. So um, we were exploring different ways of building network effects without explicitly saying we were doing that. And we were getting closer and closer to them, but we never really got there. In the meantime, we get an, an acquisition offer from monster.com for about $110 million. So we take it and we go in and start working with them and here's a company that at the time I think was worth seven billion or four and a half billion. It was a big valuation company. It was horribly run, horribly run. The management team was bad. The, the communication was bad. The technology was was not good at all. Um, you know, they had 600 people working on their platform, and we probably could have done it with three or four of our engineers who were just amazing out of MIT and Stanford, and they're just amazing folks. Um, and we looked at each other and we just like, what, what, how is this possible that these guys are acquiring us when we have the technology and we have the growth and we have the modesty? And it was because they had a network effect. They had a two sided marketplace network effect between employers and employees. The employees, 40,000 a day, would upload their resumes and the employers would spend 300 bucks to put up a job posting to get to them. And they had salespeople who were embedding that job posting process into the employers on the demand side. And then the employees were just seeing ads all over the internet and uploading their, their resumes. And the two of them were meeting in the middle in this marketplace, finding each other and finding it valuable. Uh, and there was liquidity there, if you will. Um, and so this, this business was, was at the time doing, I don't know, 700, no, it was doing a billion in revenue with horrible management, horrible technology, uh, because they had built a network effect in 97, 98 when nobody else was in that market space. And so that's when we learned what a network effect really meant and how valuable it was. And that's when we became students of, of network effect. You know, what, the, what we call Tickle, we call the business we were running at Tickle fresh produce. Because every couple of weeks we had to launch new tests to keep people interested. You have to keep putting out the fresh produce to keep people coming back. With a network effect business, you really don't. So you're much more defensible. It's harder for... for uh, for competitors to come into your market space. So now take us to you as an investor. You've shifted now, you're a VC, but even when you were running the incubator, you saw a lot of incoming uh, opportunities. Tell me about one where you saw it and you saw within five minutes, yeah, this is a network spec business. Um, one came in called Outdoorsy and they were trying to get people to list their RVs on their website so that other people could rent the RVs. So it's a two-sided uh, marketplace where uh, you've got all this supply. Uh, you know, people use their RVs for nine days a year and the rest of the time they sit in the driveway. And you've got all these people who are trying to rent RVs. And they were trying to figure out how to get those two sides connected and they couldn't figure it out. And so they came to the accelerator to figure it out and we showed them how to do it. 
but we knew immediately that that was a much bigger business than most people thought. And we knew that the company could probably take the whole market by building good software for both sides. And, um, and uh, that's, they're in the process of doing that now. So it's kind of a cross between Uber and Airbnb for RVs. Correct. Like. Yes. Correct. Um, now, tell me a story about a company or, a st you know, you don't have to say the exact one, but that came in, you saw within five minutes, nope, not network effects. Um, let's see. A uh, good example of that would be a, a mattress company. So they come in, like a company like Casper comes in and they're like, hey, we're selling mattresses. And I'm like, great, where are the network effects? And they're like, they're not network effects. It's just, you know, digital marketing is really cheap right now and we can sell a lot of these mattresses and we have a pretty good margin and we can probably raise a lot of money and make it bigger and bigger and bigger. And I'm like, oh, that's good. That's a good business. You'll probably make a lot of money doing that. And there will be other investors who will want to invest in that, but that won't be something I'll do. Got so a lot, of these, a lot of these DTC companies that um, are going to be good businesses, they just wouldn't be typically business we'll invest in. I mean, we might, we might, we might find a particular entrepreneur or a particular market segment uh, where we think it might be worth it or that we could build up a good non-network uh, effect business for a while and then switch it over. Uh, I've seen that. I mean, you look at a company like Salesforce, right? They were selling SaaS software. And then after six years, they said, let's, let's launch Force and create a platform on top of which everybody can build applications and sell into our existing base. You know, and that looks more like an operating system, it looks more like a Microsoft or an iOS play. Great network effect, really defensible network effect. And I think uh, when, for, when Salesforce did that, they were at an $18 billion market cap, and now they're at what, 80, 100? I mean, having a network effect where other people are building stuff on your platform and benefiting your, your, your customers so they never leave you, fantastic. How do you think about your ability to focus on network effects and the kind of business you want to run and your likelihood of success. How does that play out? Yeah. So, you know, we did some research into this and um, if you look at the market caps of, you know, the unicorn companies, which account for 98% of all the technology value created in the last 25 years, there's about 350, 360 of these companies. And you look at all their market caps and then you, you say which companies had a network effect at their core. The percentage of companies that had a network effect at their core that became worth a billion is, is small. It's like 32%. So I think it's, it's a small percentage of the overall unicorns, if you will. But they all got so much bigger than the companies without network effects. So you could have a great SaaS company and you know, everyone's excited. They sell for 1.4 billion, but you end up with an Uber or a Facebook or a PayPal. These are the network effect businesses, and these are the ones that get to be worth 8 billion, 10 billion, 50 billion, 100 billion, 400 billion. And, uh, and so when, when, you, when you know those numbers and you see that 70% of all the value created in tech has come from network effect businesses over the last 25 years, and there's no reason that the math is going to stop working, um, you realize that it's not that hard to focus. Uh, once you once you understand that because the time you're going to spend in non-network effect businesses isn't necessarily going to be worth it even if it does really well uh, it's not going to move the needle nearly as much as a as a good network effect business will the other thing about the acquisition i mean we had a uh, i was the first investor in a company called goodreads and um otis the ceo had been an engineer for me at tickle uh, and you know he had a network effect he had a network around book selling and and when there was an article in the new york times about how goodreads now means books for americans this was not something that amazon could sit by and and, and just accept so they had to acquire goodreads and they could not replicate goodreads they had acquired their two competitors they had tried to build their own thing it's just not it's not possible really to generally replicate these network effects um once they're once they're established and uh if they're good ones if they're strong ones and so Amazon was willing to pay anything to buy Goodreads. They had to, they didn't really have a choice and because it wasn't replicable. So, and they were the only ones who had it. So when you look at, at, at exit values, uh, you, you know, as an investor that the network effect businesses are going to have such much higher values, like a GitHub, you know, 7 billion or something for a social network of engineers. Right. I mean, amazing. Right. Um, it's because it's unreplicable. Like you can't ever build that again. That's now, what the engineers are on. So you're done. 
uh, if you want it, you got to pay whatever it takes. I mean, same thing with uh, WhatsApp, right? I mean, Facebook, you know, I think the, the opening bid from Facebook was $8 billion for WhatsApp. There was 50 employees. And they said, no, nah, come back with another bid. They're like, well, why, what, what would you want? Said, no, no, you give us a bid. <laughs> and so the price ended up being, I think, what, $21 billion, you know, because they, they, they had to pay anything to, to acquire that thing once it had the network effect. So for me, focus isn't that much of a challenge because I know the math and I've studied the math. Yeah, that's also what the crypto guys say. <laughs> look at the math, baby. I, don't argue with me. Just look at the math. But I think this is a little different. I'm not saying, I'm not necessarily comparing you to a crypto guy. I, actually, I love it. So, I mean, I do think that, does, that speaks to, that's your focus because you understand it. And you've lived it. And those lessons are in your bones. That's right. That's right. You really have to feel it. You really have to feel it. And that, that enables me to really sit down with the founders I work with and, you know, have a heart to heart with them about where they're at. Um, and uh, I do that because I'm trying to be helpful. And right. Because you have a North Star. Yeah, I have a North Star. And, I, and I, I wish people had done that for me more, too. You know, it was always helpful when someone said, no, 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 James, that's not going to work. And here's why. Yeah, totally. So do you feel like that's one of your superpowers? Um. That kind of feedback? Yeah, I think that, um, you know, uh, that type of authenticity and that type of honest talk is, uh, I think, probably uh, what people would say is my superpower. Um, because I've had so much experience and so many failures on my way to my successes, um, because I've sat in everybody's seat around the, the valley, um, I'm able to uh, give pertinent advice from personal experience. And I'm willing to give that advice. I'm willing to take the risk that they get pissed off if they're getting some critical feedback because I know how important that critical feedback can be. I've, I've given some VCs some critical feedback and then two, three, four years later received many page thank you notes uh, because, because it, it's so impactful when, when you can help someone see their, the errors of their ways and, and therefore they can go choose a path that's gonna be better for them. And I, and I, I enjoy that role. Uh, and I serve that role with the, the founders that I work with typically. Requires a lot of diplomacy. Uh, yeah, or it requires just a lot of um, affection and respect, and w both of which I have for the people I work with. And if I'm coming from that spot where I am, uh, even if I don't say the sentence the exact right way, um, I think they get where I'm coming from. Yep. So what are you seeing right now that's, new and exciting or inspiring to you in the world of, the world of tech and startups and the rest of the world? Yeah, I mean, uh, I'm, uh, my, my investing focuses, focuses are generally on computational biology, where there's a lot of data network effects and platform network effects which can be built. Um, I'm, I continue to focus on marketplaces. I've, you know, we're not done with that by any stretch. Um, and, um, uh, you know, we're, we're spending a lot of time in, in real estate and, and, and fintech. I think that um, there's going to be a lot of power given back to individuals and the people, if you will, away from the financial institutions um, using technology over the next 20 years. Um, so, so we're excited about all those areas. Um, I think in another thing that I'm excited about is the change that we're going to see in our own ecosystem. So to the extent that all these industries are being transformed by technology, our venture capital startup, Silicon Valley, Israel type of environment is gonna be transformed by software and by data uh, and by new types of relationships that can be built because of those. And uh, I'm excited to be part of that. I mean, one of the, one of the reasons that I, I love NFX and love what we're building here is because we have a whole team of software engineers that are building products for both internal use and our own efficiencies and workflows and whatnot, which is great fun, but, but also for external. So we built a thing called Signal. It's at signal.nfx.com, which is a, it's like reverse angel list where instead of the companies putting up profiles, the venture people have put up profiles and now the best founders can go and search and find them there and decide who they want to talk to. Um, and then we've built another product called the company brief. It's at the company brief.com and you, you build a brief of your company with your deck and with a bunch of metadata that sort of pulls out the most salient points that VCs need to know so they can understand if they want to talk to you. This is sort of the next generation of the deck, if you will. 
Um, and that, that system is also connected to your graph. So you can see how you can get to different investors and the investors can see how they know you. So they can have connectivity immediately to who you are and what you're doing. Um, and, and I think that this, these sorts of things are gonna start to slowly transform how founders find investors, investors find founders, um, how founders find other founders and, and the whole ecosystem works. So I, I think that's coming. Uh, for us as an industry, just like it's come for, you know, home sales and for car buying and for everything else, it's now going to come to our industry and it's going to be great. Sounds like you've built another innovative social network. Yeah, I am an old dog doing old tricks. It's correct. Now that's so cool. Thank you so much for joining us today. It's been great and I had a fabulous time hanging out with you. You as well, Amy. Thank you so much.